Evening Standard, December 1977. Music with a hardcore political bias could soon become a regular feature of the top ten if a singer called Tom Robinson continues his sudden and mercurial rise to the top. From his position of chart success, it looks as if Robinson is prepared to launch material that combines catchy rock with lyrics that deal, as he puts it, with oppressed minorities. His current political preoccupations were brought on because, he frankly admits, he is homosexual. New Musical Express the Tom Robinson band restored my faith in music, just when I'd come to the conclusion that rock and roll was one big fart and almost hung up my pogo stick forever. Because no one had a brother like Tom. No one ever had a brother like him. Tom Robinson Band began performing at the beginning of 1977. They quickly attracted not only a large audience, but also a large amount of controversy. EMI say yes to gay power. 
The TRB have been signed by EMI Records and the deal could prove to be as controversial for the company as its relationship with the Sex Pistols. A self-confessed gay, Robinson distributes pamphlets at his concerts, publicising such organisations as Rock Against Racism, Spare Rib, the National Abortion Campaign, Gay Switchboard and the Free George Ince Campaign. Because of the causes he openly supports, a number of venues have previously been reluctant to book his band. The story behind this band begins ten years ago, in a strange school in Kent. Where did you go to school, Tom? I went to school all over the place, really. I went to primary school in Godmanchester, which was near Huntingdon. I was born in Cambridge, lived some time in Huntingdon, Saffron Malden in Essex, other side of Cambridge, and eventually got sent away from school in disgrace to a place called Finchton Manor in Kent. Finchton was a kind of readjustment centre for difficult boys, if you like. The youngest guy there was about 14, the oldest something like 26, 27. In so far as you were never sent away because you'd reached a certain statutory age, therefore you must be ready to leave. Finchton was this beat up old, I suppose it must have been Elizabethan manor house. It was just an old shed and then they built bits onto it. So that it had uh, half timbering and a lot of it. The curious thing about Finchton was that the guy who started it was called George Lywood. And he started off by having kids in as guests to his private house, where he and his wife would act as host and put them up. And the therapy started there. Bit by bit, the thing grew up with its own traditions. And the Spartan conditions grew up quite simply because although the house started out with curtains and uh, carpets in the rooms and heating and things, the things didn't survive, and uh, Lywood took the line quite sensibly, I think, that, well, if, if they uh, obviously don't want curtains in the rooms, there's no reason why they should have curtains in the rooms. And uh, if the place was a bit ramshackle, that was perhaps because we let it get that way. At Finchton, Tom met Danny Custo, who's now the guitarist with the Tom Robinson band. It was always sort of like a guitar line about, you know, my mum when she was, she, she took a couple of lessons when she was younger, so it was a kind of acoustic guitar, sort of smashed up. So I started tinkling about on that, you know, in front of mirrors and things. And then I met Tom and he showed me the first few chords. Um, I just sort of, at finished and like, sat around all day and, well, you had such a lot of time, you know, and I just kind of, Listen to a lot of records, play with people there, you know. The only therapy that took place there was the fact there was these 50 kids all living together. And OK, we'd all gone there from different backgrounds, some of us from Borstals, some of us from mental hospitals and whatever, all people that they thought no other way for. The thing is, you weren't special anymore. You were just one of the, one of the lot. You were in a normal situation once more. So if you were feeling a little bit rebellious and aggressive and... Uh, maladjusted man and you've been in a bad mood and I don't want to do the washing up. There's like 14 other, 49 other guys just sort of sitting there hungry waiting for their supper. Okay, so you're maladjusted and rebellious and hungry and so are we and we want our dinner so do your washing up. And that's like the best therapy in the world I can tell you. What's this song my brother Martin about? Uh, Tom wrote a uh, kind of a well, it's a, a musical, you know, it's about, about um, these two brothers. And it, it was kind of based on, you know, we need some guys at Finchton who, who were very much, you know, like Martin. You know, Nick Carson had been through things like that. Uh, It's kind of quite sad in a way, isn't it, that song? Mm -hmm. I just want to tell you about Martin Cos nobody I know has got a brother like him As kids we could never be parted The neighbours all knew us as the terrible twins At school some kids was always looking for a fight And Martin never wanted a fuss Oh, big mouth brown, thought he'd push him around 
being three years older than I. So I smashed him in a bush with a club room stool. I got six of the best and suspended from school. But it was worth it with a brother like Martin. That'll do for now. Well, we used to nick motors for a joyride till we rammed a black Mariah in this XJ6 to give me brother time to get clear. I had to punch a few policemen before it was nicked. I got bossed off for taking and driving away, beating up the boys in blue. But Martin never missed a single visiting day. Inch from clap them to crew with all me racing mags and a little bit of news smuggling in sickies and a little no one ever had a brother like Martin no one's ever had a brother like him now people get the wrong impression with Martin not him I know he doesn't mix much but he's no snob because the weekend I'll come out of Remando same day, he got Uncle Ruby to find me this job. And back at me Nancy, we painted my room. I bought me a brand new carpet. There was all my old records, books on a shelf, and a second hand telly from the market. You can get a bit old when you've been inside But I'm the old bastard till he almost died Cos no one's ever had a brother like Martin No one ever had a brother like him One more time! No one ever had a brother like Martin No one ever had a brother like him Do you think Finchon had some long-term influence on your outlook? It's where I first slept with a boy. And that was a whole lot of fun. I've carried on doing it ever since. What age was that? I'd say 19, I think. But I didn't really sort of come to terms with it until I left there and moved to London and thought, well, what the hell, you've only got one life. Get on with it. It was coming out as gay, like a, a slow, painful process, or was it like a... Well, listen, you're talk... If you're a homosexual, you're still homosexual when you're nine years old. I mean, that's... People don't seem to realise this, that, like, when you're... It, even homosexuals are kids, too, at one stage. And for a teenage person who is gay, it's very, very hard, because you're the person that your parents are still busy warning you against. And you think it's all going to be just like dirty old men in raincoats and public toilets or Larry Grayson and limp wrists and stuff. And uh, you think, I'm not part of that. I don't want to know about that. That isn't me. I don't find that interesting. And uh, you hate yourself. You can't come to terms with it. And if you hate yourself, nobody else can love you, really, ever. And, and you just absolutely eat yourself up with pointless self-hatred. And the number of people that ruin most of their teenage lives simply because there's something as insignificant and silly as homosexual with all this idiotic self-hatred and guilt and loathing when they could actually be just getting used to the idea and living their lives as who they are that's pretty bad it took me till I was 23 years old before I even started to enjoy life just because the one little part of the life was blown up out of all proportion into being a major problem, which it wasn't. This is the office of Gay Switchboard, where I used to work as a volunteer about two years ago. It's a voluntary organisation. All the people work here are unpaid. It's kept up purely by donations from people who are grateful for the service and have used it, and handles something like 3,000 calls a week. The range of information on these files and maps and things ranges from legal advice, what your rights under the British law are. Um, for instance, in Northern Ireland and Scotland, homosexuality is completely illegal for anybody. Um, medical advice, accommodation, then a whole gamut of groups and clubs and places where people can go. So once somebody knows the number, 8377324, they've got access to all the rest of that information 24 hours a day. Oh, gay switchboard, can I help you? Good evening. 
say no more. There is exactly the conversation. There is exactly the organisation you need. It's called Parents Inquiry, and there's a lady called Mrs. Rose Robertson who runs it. And um, I'll just dig through and find you the exact telephone number and address. The address is um, the address is 16 Honley Road, H O N L E Y. Catford, SE6. So parents inquiry, it's either four teenage gays or their parents, like if either's having problems with the other. They can write to them, but I'll just see now if I can find a phone number for them, yeah? Hold on then. We got the phone number for parents inquiry. Yes. Six nine eight one eight one five. Alrighty. Bring us again sometime. Bye now. Hoax calls, yeah. The thing is, you have to always, you must always treat hoax calls as if they're genuine because mm. there's just that little chance He's what? that it is somebody. If somebody puts on a funny voice, it's possible they oh, speak I with see, a funny yeah. voice. Um, or they're nervous or something no, like that. And it's better for you to get anyway, snubbed yeah. by a hoaxer than for you to Lionel. snub. Somebody oh, is in desperate well. need you speak to at any one given time. You speak to Lionel as well, so, you? like, you stay civil with them, you speak to unless you well. get absolute outright abuse, in which case they're fair game for you to give them an yeah, earful back. You know Do you think coming out as gay was part of a politicisation process? Certainly, because like, if your friends get, if you're getting into trouble because of it, if you're getting on the wrong side of the law, or on the wrong side of society, or respectable, or publicly acceptable behaviour, then you start realising that the things you encounter on account of that aren't exclusive to you, but that certain other parts of the public are getting it in different ways and for different reasons, but off the same people. So, I mean, you don't have to be gay to be beaten up by the police, but it helps. You don't have to smoke dope to be beaten up by the police, but it helps. You don't have to be black to be picked up on sus, but it helps. You don't realise it happens until you look for it. The British police are the best in the world. I don't believe one of these stories I've heard. About the raiding gay pubs for no reason at all. Nine in the customers up by the wall. Picking out people, knocking them down. Resisting arrest as they're kicked on the ground. Searching their houses. sort of thing happens here. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Hey. Sing if you're glad to be gay. Sing if you're happy that way. Pictures of naked young women are fun. It's in bits of Make 
their jokes Caleb's ridiculous Join their laughter The bugger's illegal now What more are they after? After leaving Finchton, Tom joined the group Café Society. They lasted three years, released one album and achieved very little success. After reuniting with Danny Custo, the embryonic Tom Robinson band met drummer Brian Taylor, known as The Dolphin. Well, I blame my whole musical inception mostly on my mother, I think. It was due to her thriftiness that I obtained my first drum kit. See, I come from a very musical family. Um, we had like a family band and she bought this drum kit for my brother and after a couple of weeks he proved that he was going to be totally inadequate on it and because she didn't want to flog it and she spent all this money on it I think it was something like 35 quid uh, she said that I had to play it being, being as I was only five at the time I didn't really have much chance to argue I was I sat there and she that stood over me, kind of whipped me into practicing for the first two or three years. Uh, what sort of family band was it? Well, it was a bit interesting. I mean, it's not kind of rock and roll. It was accordions, in fact. We used to do weddings and uh, anniversaries, just kind of general dances, playing anything from Eviva Espana to Tulips of Amsterdam. They always complained that I played too loud. I always complained that they played too quiet. Everybody knows where Tom's coming from because Tom's the front man, he's the singer, he's the spokesman. He's the one that, that you open up the paper and it's Tom Robinson says this, Tom Robinson does this, Tom Robinson is this. But nobody knows too much about the band. And we're always getting asked, um, I mean, are you just in this for the ride or are your political motives, do they run on a parallel with, with Tom's? Uh, does he sleep with you? Yeah, we get asked all that. Um, all I can say to the political motives is if the, my motives weren't the same as Tom's, I don't think I'd be in his band. And uh, no, he doesn't sleep with me. From the beginning, the Tom Robinson Band have issued regular bulletins to their audience, a collection of news, jokes and feedback from fans. They discuss the next issue with Pip Turner, who organises the bulletin. Yeah, right. Bulletin 12, Tom. Oh, my God. Yes. Already? Yes. We have a week to do it. Oh. Oh, have you got that thing on Roddy Llewellyn? Oh. Right here. That, oh, that is... The Daily Mirror wins again. Was it Woman's Own, though, you think? The real source? Woman's Own was what, what it was publishing. It was, um, this is just like all stuff I've uh, assembled. It's fetishes. Know. Yes. School kids would get some right royal thrashings if Roddy Llewellyn had his way. For the man who, about town who counts Princess Margaret among his friends, admits he is a real disciplinarian. Old Etonian Roddy, 31, says sternly, Schools should bring back the whip. I was whipped the whole time till the blood was pouring down my legs. It didn't do me any harm. He admits that he is selfish, intolerant, and incapable of holding down a job for long. I think that's got to go in. Yeah, now what are we going to do about Danny and his drag bit? That what drag be? bit? Oh, the picture in the enemy. Well, we can... I think it should go in the bulletin. I think it should go in the bulletin. I think Danny's picture in a dress I would, should yes, be in the I bulletin. do. I do, with well, a really I, cryptic I don't know, comment. I mean, we got a lot of stick off the feminists. Yeah, anyway. I mean, the, 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 I think that was a load of rubbish, though. I mean, all that, it, it's offensive to women. I know the woman who took that photo, and she thought it was hilarious. And even my mum thought it was hilarious. Sure, but it's not like so much the fact that people get annoyed by it, but as the, the fact of it sort of reinforcing certain stereotypes into, 
in terms of like this was gay women no, who were getting no, annoyed fun. about it. It's fun. I mean, people dress up. Kids dress up the whole time just because it's fun. Yes, but I mean, kids shoot each other with guns because it's fun. The whole point about it, the reason why drag is oppressive, is is simply that there's a, a stereotype that men have to f conform to a certain role and they have to be manually and masculine and aggressive and women have to conform to a certain other role yeah. where they have to be f yeah. feminine, passive and petite yes. and there are these two rigid roles yeah. that have to be conformed to and therefore it's very funny to see a man dressing up as woman and it's a sort of that kind of oppressive j joke he was only dressed up as it looked like more like a curtain to me you were draped yeah. in. Oh, sure. I mean, I know the whole thing's done as a bit of fun not to oppress anybody or sort of... And I think he looks hysterical in a dress. I mean, a bit like... <laughs> Frank, I think you should wear one more often. You didn't I almost went for you. You didn't notice my makeup, did you? No, it made you look a bit like Freddie Mercury, actually. I know. I've given up doing my Freddie Mercury. I've got to do a Freddie Mercury impersonation. But... <laughs> oh, I can't do it anymore. Tom Robinson, how are you? My name is Yuriko. I heard some of your songs, which I like so much. Especially the words are great. Many people in Japan think that Tom Robinson Band is a group for only homosexuals. That is a matter for regret, that people do not understand you correctly. I hear you have Tom Robinson Band Bruton in London and some other things that can make propaganda. Would you send me some, please? Summer is almost over in Japan. Did you have a nice vacation? Perhaps you will come to Japan in the winter of 79. Please take care of yourself. I'm writing to the Tom Robinson band where I hope someone will be reading this. I myself am unemployed and taking taxpayers' money. And everyone I talk to says I'm a lazy shit, but I just ignore these people because they're just members of a crowd. I didn't get any O-levels, but I'm not as stupid as I think I am. I'm not a snob, but at the same time I don't go around spitting at people because I don't think that does anything constructive. I'm going to your concert in Glasgow and hope to talk to you afterwards. I heard that the band are £25,000 in debt and hope that the money I pay for my ticket will help towards this.
bunch of long-haired hippie communist perverts. This noise level in this hall is unacceptably loud, these damn speaker things. We've been measuring them with the decibel meter. You young people will be deaf by the time you're 30. The Oxford Distressed Gentlefolks Association, just over the road, has been severely upset by the bars vibrating on the mantelpiece. Shut up! Have you no respect for your elders and betters anymore? Be quiet! Good grief, look at you. I thought Oxford was a seat of learning. Looks like you're doing a good bath, some of you. Do you mean to say you pay money to come and listen to this drivel? Good God. What we need to do is see a return to the traditional British values. Bring back the cane in the grammar schools. Church on Sundays. A spell in the army would do you all a lot of good. National service. We need to see a return to discipline, obedience, morality, virtue and freedom. What we want is freedom from the Reds and the Blacks and the criminals prostitutes, pansies and punks, football hooligans, juvenile delinquents, lesbians and left-wing scum, freedom from the niggers and the packies and the unions, freedom from the gypsies and Jews. Success came quickly to TRB. By the end of 1977, they had a recording contract, a hit single, and an extraordinary amount of publicity, directed at what they stood for as much as their music, Melody Maker. I'd feel a lot more for the Tom Robinson band if they quit fooling about their social politics and got on with the music. When it comes to making rock sounds, they are undoubtedly one of the best of the emerging bands. But apparently the TRB stand for gays, punks, gypsies, unmarried mothers, dope smokers, rock and rollers, squatters, immigrants, the unemployed, etc., etc. That might sound fine, but how do they stand in the eyes of a punk who can't stand blacks, or a gay who hates dope smokers, or an immigrant who despises the jobless? Some people say he's using music to infiltrate young people with political ideas. Well, they're not broadly <laughs> political ideas. They're... They're, they're ideas about uh, society and whether people matter and such questions as that. And those things are really basic to everyone. You can't talk yeah. about politics being totally separate in that way. People say he's just a politician using his music to get his views across. But I think he's just a, a, a musician who's using politics, which is a, a, a survival form for people, young people like us. We've got to identify with something, and his politics come across in the music rather than the other way around. <laughs>
Up against the wall from Power in the Darkness, Tom Robinson Band, of course. Up against the wall from Power in the Darkness, Tom Robinson Band, of course. Um, do you ever get to the stage where I feel, actually, at the moment, that the sort of the political aura that surrounds you is is overpowering the musical side of the band? It's becoming sort of more important to talk about your political points of view than, than the actual music that you're turning out. Well, I, mean, I didn't form the group in order to become a politician. I just stood for Parliament or something, I guess. Mm -hmm. Formed the group to play rock and roll. But then, if you have an audience and you have people who care about your group and they spend their pocket money on it and whatever, I think... You owe it to them to um, be honest with them and be direct with them and not lecture at them or preach at them anything, but tell them the truth as you perceive it. But show them uh, your viewpoint quite honestly and directly, just the same as any songwriter does. I think Jeremy Mitchell, Bob Dylan or any of those sort of people still say, well, from what I'm feeling at the moment, it feels like this. And they say it quite honestly and they lay it on the line. And then the audience can take it or leave it. And they think, oh, Bob thinks that. Well, let's see what some of the callers have got uh, points to put to you now. We've got a lady from Stonycroft on the telephone. Her name's Louise Spence. Hello, Louise. Hello. Uh, you are now talking to Tom. We'd like to put your question to him. Hello. Hi. When did you get first get involved with Dancing Nazi League? Well, they've only, been, they've only been going a short time anyway, haven't they? They formed this year. Uh, the thing we were mainly involved with was Rock Against Racism, yeah. which formed about the same time as our group. Rock Against Racism seemed like a good idea at the time because... What we call rock and roll is based on black people's music, like jazz, blues. Um, the early Elvis Presley stuff was based on black music. And I think it's really bad if you, if you like the music, but you don't like the people. And that the two go hand in hand. And so Rock Against Racism seems like a good idea. Yeah. OK, Louise. Um, can I just ask him another question? Yeah, go on, Lou. <laughs> um, you say that you don't really like to be looked upon as a political type of figure. Well, why do you write songs that, you know, involve a lot of political feeling? Well, that's a very fair question. The thing is that um, it's those songs that are getting a lot of attention. I also write songs like I Wish I Had a Grey Cortina and I got a, a really stiff letter from the Ford Strikers saying, how can you support a multinational imperialist company that's exploiting its workers in this way? And they couldn't handle the fact that we were doing just an ordinary humorous song about, oh, I wish I had a 1972 Ford Cortina. And uh, there's Martin and there's Motorway. And there's some new love songs we're doing at the moment on the tour. So, see what I mean? Like, there's all kinds of songs, but it just so happens that people have picked out on those particular ones to make the big fuss over. Yeah. OK, Louise. Yeah, we've got to okay. press on. We've got some more callers on. Okay. See uh, you. Thanks for calling. Just talking to you turns me on You turn me on You turn me on You just turn me on You turn me on You turn me on, you turn me on. It's amazing how, you know, we had that kind of lucky break. We got, got a deal and everything, you know. Do you think it was just luck? A hell of a lot of luck, yeah. Being in the right place at the right time, you know. Is there much pressure that comes with it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pressure. 
pressure. I still think we're trying to evaluate our own success level because just recently we've had our records haven't been selling as well as our early records, but our popularity still seems to be going on the up. And it's very difficult to comprehend all that because from where we see it, we're thinking, blimey, we're finished. We're, we're a one-hit wonder, we're dead and gone. When in fact, things are still rising for us. It's just the, the, the way that we're looking at it, it seems all wrong, you know. It seems that we're almost at it. When we were playing at clubs the size of the Marquee Club in London, which holds about eight or 900 people, it was easy enough to get badges printed up and give everybody that came out of the gig a badge. It was easy enough for anyone that wanted to come backstage, come and let them come backstage, have a talk to them. It was easy enough to print up eight or nine hundred copies of the bulletin and give it to them. When you're dealing with a tour on which the average gig size is 2,000 people, after a gig, you want to talk to the people who've been to it and enjoyed it or want to come and make some kind of criticism. But there might be like 50 or 60 of them and all it means is that within the hour or so you have after the gig, you just get time for a handshake and something completely patronising like that, or autographs. And you, you end up playing the kind of games that you always thought you'd try and pre present an alternative to. No way, mate, no way! It's all right if you hold on. Thank you, thank you. Very good course. Very good. Have you seen a band before? No, never. Magic! Hey. Uh, magic! Hey. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah. Who's next? Can't get out. Can you let these people out so somebody else can get in? Let them out first. Let them out, otherwise we can't get you in. Right. We've got a sort of general question. What do you find the hardest thing of all is in, in doing this sort of this job you're doing or this life you're living? I tell you, the hardest thing of all is not to get too too smug and pompous and sort of complacent, self-righteous and I mean I find all the time I'm talking to the camera and all the time I'm, I'm talking on this program I'm immediately jumping up onto a soapbox as soon as you like offer me a little red rag like to the bull and I go charging down at it and uh, all the guns blazing trying to right all the wrongs in the world and it's, it's very tempting to do that and make a complete fool of yourself, getting really self-righteous and doing a sort of Florence Nightingale, Joan Baez sort of thing. And uh, losing sight of the fact that when we actually get on stage with the band, when there's the four of us interacting and playing together, it's a whole lot of fun as well. And the reason we formed the group in the first place wasn't to go and uh, set the, the entire world to rights, thank you very much, it was to go and play rock and roll, which is the one thing we all love doing.
In December 1978, as this film was being completed, drummer Brian Taylor decided to quit the Tom Robinson band. A week later, the TRB started work on their second album. The story continues. <laughs> 